Okay, well, welcome to today's uh, Grand Strategy uh, uh, seminar uh, hosted by the Center for Grand Strategy and the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War. Um, and it's my great pleasure um, to, uh, well, first of all, I should just say who I am. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Professor Joe Maiolo, uh, Professor of International History in the Department of War Studies. Uh, and I'm also director for the um, Sir Michael Howard Center for the His uh, History of War. Um, and I, it's our enormous pleasure to be hosting uh, Dr. Julie Klinger uh, here, here today. Um, Julie holds a PhD in geography from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she's currently uh, uh, assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences at the University of Delaware and associate director of the of a Minerals, Materials and Societies program. And I guess, uh, Julie, you, you've just moved because I, I had you at Boston and then you uh, 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 so congratulations on, 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 on I guess, what's on a, a, a fairly new appointment. Thank you. Yeah, just before the pandemic is when I arrived. <laughs> so oh, I had okay. about six <laughs> weeks on campus, yes. <laughs> so you look forward to meeting your colleagues and finding your office. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, um, Julie's focus uh, in her research is on the dynamics of global uh, resource frontiers with a particular focus on social and environmental sustainability. And um, we're, we're, I highly recommend uh, her award-winning book, uh, Rare Earth Frontiers from Terrestrial, Terrestrial Subsoils to Lunar Landscapes, published by uh, Columbia University Press. And um, it's widely available uh, as an ebook uh, and um, uh, in and, and a lovely paperback. And uh, having, having read most of it, I have to say it's be a beautifully crafted piece and I can see why uh, it, it, it won an award. And um, she's here today to talk about contemporary global earth politics, persistent myths, policy challenges, and possible pathways. And um, uh, just, just before I turn over to uh, Julie to, to begin her presentation, I can say that um, uh, uh, feel free along the way to add your questions to the Q&A function or to the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll be monitoring both. Um, and Julie's uh, uh, kindly agreed to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll, we'll turn over to question and answer. We'll be recording the presentation, but uh, we will not be recording the question and answer session. So, uh, um, you know, so just so that you're aware. Um, so um, with that, I'm gonna turn everything over to Julie and invite her to begin her presentation. Right. Thank you so much, Joe, and thank you to the School of Security uh, Studies and King's College London for, for having me. Uh, in the midst of a pandemic and at the end of the term with Zoom fatigue running high, I am encouraged by the fact that nevertheless, we've all gathered here to talk and think about uh, rare earth politics and to look squarely at the challenges that we're facing and also think about possible pathways forward. So with that, I'll share my screen and we will dive right in. Okay, so today, as promised, we're talking about the persistent myths, policy challenges, and possible pathways forward. This is less of a scholarly talk, although I'm happy to get into theory and methods and big ideas and all of this in the Q&A, and more of a discussion of what I see as the real challenges to formulating sensible policy and politics around these critical resources. Um, so just the cliff notes of my book, uh, it's based on five years of in-depth research and field work in the US, China, Brazil, and Germany. Uh, I was able to do the in-depth research in China that I did because I had a linguistic and cultural fluency um, from living in different parts of China for about five years uh, prior and during to the research. One of the key findings is that resource extraction as we have done it is inseparable from the politics of sacrifice, of landscapes, of livelihoods but we can change this. And this contention is the basis of my policy work to support sustainable rare earth sourcing uh, in the US and internationally. Uh, to research this book, I conducted field work either in or about the various sites that you see here. Uh, regrettably, I did not have a chance to travel to the moon uh, to investigate the rare earth situation there. Um, but yes, as you can see, my research, uh, is, while global in scope, those of you who are savvy to the contemporary geographies of rare earth prospecting and extraction will note some conspicuous absences here. But the beautiful thing about research is that it is endless and ongoing. 
Uh, within China, my primary site of analysis is that stripy bit there, which indicates Baotou municipality in Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, uh, located in Northern China. And I was really interested in uh, not, not just following the grand uh, international strategies and actors and policy pronouncements, but also connecting big ideas and uh, global political and economic currents uh, to the people who are actually responsible for getting the elements to us from far corners of the world, right? Humble, hardworking, everyday people who are absolutely crucial to sustaining modern life as we know it from the global rare earth frontier. I should also note that photos of people um, from the mining site in China either do not include faces or come from other sources. Uh, not taking pictures of people was one of several necessary measures that I took to ensure local context that I was not in fact a journalist. Um, and so one had to behave in a way that uh, uh, people do not associate with journalists, which is not taking very many pictures. Um, so one of the uh, key salient factors that people might know about uh, China and global rare earth politics is that uh, China lost a WTO appeals and removed all export quotas, you know, as of January 1st of 2014 and then later removed um, uh, further export quotas in 2016. Uh, they've been uh, the uh, at the direction of uh, the central government, uh, China's rare earth industry has been consolidating and uh, that, in that includes closing down private mines, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment and its significance. But let's dive in now to its persistent myths. There's about seven that I'd like to cover today. And uh, some of these will be familiar to you, others maybe not, uh, let's see. So the first one, and this bears repeating um, until the myth is uh, thoroughly dispelled from, from our imaginaries and our discourse that rare earths are not rare. Uh, the, the first reference to uh, uh, this misnomer, I actually found the earliest reference that I found was uh, in 1907. But this idea that rare earths are rare, it fuels some dangerous assumptions. Dangerous assumptions such as, you know, China mines the most rare earth elements because China has the most. Right, which can uh, set us up to think about um, you know, vulnerabilities or imagined vulnerabilities that we actually don't have. Um, and you know, if we uh, believe that rare earths are rare, then that allows us to make all sorts of assumptions, right? If they're scarce, that means they'll be subject then to war or conflict. And of course, uh, the myth of scarcity um, then makes us leap to the conclusion that they can only be obtained at great cost. So great sacrifices are justifiable. Now this is a really potent trope in pop culture commentary and some policy. And over the past decade plus that I've been researching rare earth elements, I've seen uh, in some circles, uh, much to my dismay, a very fluid boundary between uh, the fact of what these elements are and the myths and stories that we tell ourselves about uh, so-called rare but extraordinarily important uh, elements. So this is a screenshot, of course, from Avatar 2009, um, which it, they're holding a rock that looks an awful lot like a very useful type of rare earth element. So if we believe that rare earth elements are rare, then how do we get them? Uh, the assumption then is that we have to go to great lengths. You know, do we mine the moon? Do we dig up the Amazon? Do we charge into a war-torn region such as uh, Southern Afghanistan? Do we take as the um, uh, founder of Blackwater advocated to the Trump administration um, and in an op-ed in the Washington Street Journal, do we take an East India Company approach to Afghanistan and uh, privatize the war and fuel it by rare earth mining? Do we dig up biodiversity hotspots in tropical Africa or dig under the Greenland ice sheet or scrape up the ocean floor, right? If they're rare, these are our choices. But actually, um, based on this map, um, from the USGS and bear in mind that USGS um, publications are credible but also conservative, meaning that they only report what is officially reported to them. Nevertheless, we see that there are hundreds of known deposits documented by the USGS. So rare earth elements really are not rare. All right, so having settled that, let's move on to the second myth. Right, so if rare earth elements are not rare, and this is one of the motivating uh, questions for my book, why is it that the geography of their production is 
so strange, concentrated in a few far-flung regions throughout the world. And uh, the second myth here is that red tape and environmental regulation ruined the rare earth industry in the West and handed it to China. So the assumption here is that if only we had less regulation, the West would not have lost its rare earth industry. But actually, um, global economic deregulation and disinvestment were decisive factors in shifting industrial and innovative capacity to China. Now, it's possible to look at a chart like this. This is a, a particularly visually pleasing one I, I found um, from the visual capitalists, but there are many charts that show um, the uh, precipitous rise of China's dominance in uh, rare earth production. And then you see a peak uh, in the early 2000s, uh, and then you, we're starting to see now diversification um, as other actors uh, re-enter the game. All right, now it's possible to look at this and to imagine all sorts of things, uh, conspiracy on the part of China, too much red tape uh, by a bunch of tree huggers in the West or what have you, but none of those actually tell us what it actually takes to build a global monopoly over rare earth mining and processing. So um, in my archival research in China, I looked, at, I looked uh, deeply into this question. So shortly after the founding of the PRC on October 1st, 1949, uh, Chairman Mao traveled to Moscow. So Mao and Stalin had a shared agenda to convert the windswept steppes of Inner Mongolia into a military industrial heartland that could provision both republics in the struggles against Western capitalism and Japanese imperialism. So this served the interests of Stalin as he reimagined the abundant iron and quote unquote non-ferrous metals, uh, which is a euphemism for rare earths as well as radioactive materials uh, in by an oboe. He imagined these as provisioning a world communist uh, revolution directed from Moscow. So Mao Zedong had two primary interests here to definitively incorporate the region of Inner Mongolia into the territory of the PRC and to use the raw materials there to build a new nation. So the strategy from the get-go from the founding of the PRC was a sort of uh, vertical integration, the creation of an industrial uh, heartland. So of all the Sino-Soviet cooperation projects that laid the foundations for China's contemporary industrial geography, Bauto was the premier model project and people in Bauto are still proud of this. Uh, they reference it today. There's monuments all over the city as well. Um, locals are proud of this, right? So um, China's dominance first and foremost is an outcome of planning, investment and international cooperation. Uh, that is what laid the foundation for what came later when Reagan, Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping respectively um, initiated their economic deregulation strategies, right? So the tenets of deregulation in the West that made it easier for uh, capital uh, and industry to move overseas uh, intersected really nicely with uh, Deng Xiaoping's open up and reform um, in the latter two decades of the 20th century. And this produced a new global economic reality that took shape through the 80s and 90s and into the present, or into the present rather. So deregulating industry in the West and also in China by uh, building, having first built this solid industrial foundation uh, and further than decollectivizing the communes and introducing 400 million newly disempowered laborers into the global workforce, China became a very attractive place for heavy industry. And so this forced um, countries, uh, companies in other countries to choose whether to transfer their industries to, dis to invest or disinvest in competitive R&D or to remove regulations or incentives or cleaner productions at home in order to compete uh, with this uh, new economic reality that was taking place out of China. All right, so within China, the largest site by far, as I noted in rare earth mining is the Bayan Obo super complex. So what we have here is a satellite image of the mine. It measures about six miles or uh, 12 some kilometers from end to end. And this is the source now of about half of all rare earth elements consumed worldwide. So transitioning from um, a rather humble mining complex in 1959 to the global rare earth capital uh, at the turn of the millennium was not an accident and it wasn't a one-sided thing. It wasn't a matter of um, planning or conspiracy on the part of China, nor was it a matter simply of, of too much or too little regulation in the West, but rather a convergence of these two um, in a way that I think was actually quite difficult to predict or foresee. The key point here is this, is that as, as Western countries were opting out of rare earth mining and processing, 
China was opting in, so scaling up R&D as other countries were scaling down. Now let's look at the third myth. So rare earth mining and processing is necessarily environmentally destructive. So uh, certainly if you visit uh, rare earth mining sites around China, um, and particularly if you did so when, when I started doing it a little over a decade ago, um, it would be uh, entirely reasonable to conclude that these things can only be had at great social and environmental cost. But if we assume that rare earth mining is necessarily destructive, then we also assume that someone somewhere has to bear the burden and social and environmental safeguards are unrealistic. But actually, and more precisely, and um, I'm even further convinced of this based on uh, my review of the Chinese scientific literature and conversations with, um, with engineers and technicians and uh, regulators within China, that actually it's the practice of mining with minimal regard for environmental protection or occupational health and safety that is actually destructive. So not the mining itself, it's not that, um, that we lack the know-how uh, in China or overseas for how to do this uh, more sustainably. It's simply that that has not been priority. And this has come uh, in China with a pretty serious cost. So here you're looking at a satellite image of Bauto City, which um, is this uh, model Sino-Soviet uh, industrial heartland uh, where most of the rare earth materials that um, are now sourced to uh, China North Rare Earths Company are actually processed. And you can see here heavily contaminated soil uh, surrounding this sort of open tailings pond that has no liner, nothing to stop the uh, pollution from seeping into the soil and groundwater. All of this is um, at a slightly higher elevation and separated by very sandy soils from the Yellow River. And so over the past several decades, uh, and this has been documented, um, mainly by Chinese scientists, but also by uh, environmental journalists working together with citizens organizations, the steady creep of pollution through the soil uh, to the Yellow River. And of course, this is the primary agricultural area that supports the city and also uh, uh, several peasant communities as well as an aquaculture area. Um, I'm going to show a couple of images of human and animal suffering uh, on the next slide. So if you don't want to see that, uh, feel free to avert your eyes. I'll let you know when it's passed. Um, so here, uh, the primary ailments that emerge are not actually due to uh, exposure to rare earth elements themselves, but exposure to other things that are brought up with the ores and the raw materials. Um, that are just present in uh, the geology of this particular place. And these uh, happen to be fluoride and arsenic. Um, and so uh, prolonged exposure to uh, fluoride and uh, arsenic lead to ailments such as skeletal fluorosis, uh, where the long bones become brittle, but they also continue to grow. And uh, while your uh, soft tissues do not, and so it can result in a debilitating uh, and very painful condition. In uh, livestock, this manifests as long tooth disease where um, the animal's teeth continue to grow but they become brittle and eventually they can't eat and starve to death. And acute chronic arsenic toxicity manifests in, in a number of forms but um, most conspicuously in lesions on skin and teeth. And so um, there's also um, uh, research carried out by public health researchers in China that documents uh, the uh, uh, high incidences of birth defects, cancers, and cognitive and developmental delays among children uh, living within this watershed. So I've moved on now. Um, I'd like to point out that this photo is not black and white. Um, this is a photo from the tailings pond adjacent to the Bionova mine in Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. Um, and we'll return to, return to this uh, in a moment. Um, but I would like to point out that these sorts of things, the pollution, uh, human and animal suffering, and all of this, um, whatever we end up doing with uh, our rare earth supply chains, we have to avoid recreating this at home and be supportive of China's efforts to clean this up. So in the 21st century, this is a preposterous price to pay for innovation, and there's nothing really innovative. Uh, I would argue about the wholesale destruction of landscapes and lives, even in the name of critical material security. And especially when we are talking about sourcing these things uh, to power our transition to a post carbon future. So among China's cleanup efforts, uh, one of the most conspicuous changes that um, that local officials noted uh, when I was conducting research for the book um, at the earlier part of the decade is all of a sudden, right around 2000, 2009, 2010, 
uh, polluters started paying their fines to the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection. Uh, prior to that, it had just been kind of a joke, right? Um, environmental officials would go out and uh, document or note cases of illegal dumping or uh, environmentally irresponsible behavior, and they would issue fines to the offending companies, and of course, these would never be paid. But at some point, that started to change. Right, so we we have had now for about a decade heightened environmental enforcement, as as part of a central strategy to change the country's position in the global division of toxic labor, to shift from a net exporter of rare earth elements to a net importer, and this has been combined with the forced closure and consolidation of a number of private. Uh, mining companies and the consolidation into what, what are now called the big six uh, rare earth companies operating in China. So small, independently owned and some clandestine mining sites, they were forced to either sell out or shut down over a period of a couple of years. So what you're looking at here is an abandoned office building um, that uh, that I visited, I guess, to the extent that I could uh, in uh, Inner Mongolia in 2013. Now, the fourth myth, um, this is also worth addressing. Um, the fourth myth is that China embargoed rare earths um, against Japan in 2010. Now, scholars of, of war and conflict will know that an embargo is a very specific thing. Um, now, the narrative is that the Chinese government ordered the embargo of rare earth shipments to Japan in retaliation for an ongoing uh, Japanese actions and an ongoing dispute over the Senkaku or the Diaoyu Islands. Um, now, an embargo is an official act, right? A, a stoppage of trade undertaken by one government against another in a time of war or in a case of a serious treaty breach. Now, this was of course reinforced by a New York Times headline and has since been treated as accepted fact in the policy circles that, uh, that I engage with. Now, what did happen is that yes, shipments were disrupted from one port in Eastern China and about one third of Japan's ports reported some sort of disruption uh, in, in rare earths and other shipments uh, at the time. But this was not a calculated move by the central government and my research at the port in question really verifies that this was a matter of local people taking things into their own hands. And this is of course corroborated by the fact that China Customs Authority app apparently had no idea that anything was awry until Japan's Customs Authority inquired after it. We'll move right along here to our fifth myth here, which is that, and this is of course related to earlier myths, which is you know, the solution is to open more mines outside of China, right? So the assumption is that China controls most of the rare earth mining. And you can see the bunch of photos here of uh, remote and far flung front prospective frontiers uh, from earlier in the presentation. But actually, China is now a net importer of rare earth ores. In fact, China became a net importer of rare earths in 2018 for the first time since 1985. And this is a result of a number of factors of reducing domestic mining output uh, to clean up contaminated sites and to import from new mines opening overseas to emphasize value added processing and to increase R&D in technological applications and also to enhance the profile of higher tech exports, right? So one of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, campaigns has been to make the made in China label um, something of high status and high quality. And this is actually quite closely related then to our sixth myth, which uh, often gets confused, particularly in uh, defense related discourses. Um, now, the myth is that the world is dependent on China for rare earth elements, full stop. And this is, this is indicative of, of the kind of fuzzy thinking that I think has gotten us into trouble and stymied um, the development of more robust and uh, effective policy. So the assumption is, of course, that if China cuts off rare earth exports again, then the rest of the world will be unable to build its necessary technologies. Now, while this may be true in some sectors more precisely, and particularly um, to folks in the, defense, in the defense sector, it's not rare earth elements per se. Right, that are the problem. So it's not that you know uh, the U.S. military won't be able to build, um, you know, its uh, its aircraft or missiles if China stops exporting refined rare earth oxides. That's not what's needed. Rather, it's the rare earth bearing 
tech components, right? The technological components that are manufactured in and exported from China that are actually quite important. And even amidst all of the trade disputes um, of the previous administration in the US with China, uh, we didn't actually see a disruption to these rare earth bearing technological components. And I think that's really important, but I guess, um, Perhaps that's not as well known as it should be because it doesn't make as uh, juicy of a headline. Uh, let's move on then to the seventh myth um, that renewable energy technology is the primary driver of increased demand for rare earths. So the assumption and the narrative is that renewable energy technology uses lots of rare earth elements, therefore, quote, green energy has a dirty little secret. And you'll see why I'm putting it in quotes here. Right, so this is a, a popular headline, a popular talking point, um, both among those who are concerned with making sure that the transition to uh, renewable energy is in fact sustainable for all involved, as well as those who are, who are deploying this discourse in bad faith in order to undermine efforts to transition to renewable energy technology. Um, but in fact, if we look at the supply webs of rare earth elements, um, in the energy sectors, we see that every major form of energy generation, whether nuclear, fossil, big hydropower, or renewable, they rely to some extent on rare earth elements. Um, if not in the refining process, then in, in the transportation infrastructure or the generation um, or the generation technologies themselves. All right. So those are our seven myths. Let's move on to the policy challenges. And for the major policy challenges, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I have outlined uh, three major ones. And uh, I phrased them in the form of a question because I'd like us to really think about what it takes to uh, engage and overcome these challenges. So the first one, are we capable of a broad-based conceptualization and integration of the challenges, needs, and strategies that characterize the entire rare earth supply web. And so we have uh, up here in the corner, a series of photos of important applications for rare earth elements, everything from big physics, right? This is the uh, large Hadron Collider uh, to advanced uh, modes of transportation and energy generation, lasers, uh, surgical, dental, medical, uh, uh, energy applications, as well as um, a variety of our information technologies, and also some elements such, such as cerium impart this lovely pink color um, in, in glass and other elements. So they're used in lasers and also rose colored glasses. So we have to consider then, right? We, we have to consider the material, financial and policy needs of multiple sectors and ask which sector or sectors has the priority. Uh, what we've seen uh, in the US at least is um, an emphasis really on one or two sectors, uh, primarily defense. Uh, what we've seen uh, in, the, in the EU is an emphasis on uh, auto, uh, automobility and transportation, but really uh, we have to consider the entire web as opposed to the entire chain of rare earth uh, supplies. And we also have to look at the infrastructural needs of the entire supply chain from mining to recycling. What kinds of infrastructure, uh, physical, right, uh, as well as social and political are needed in order to um, reinvigorate and sustain new supply chains from mining to recycling. And also we have to address sustainability concerns across multiple and often competing interest groups. Um, as I'm sure uh, you know, scholars, scholars present today are no doubt aware that the term sustainability means very different things to different people. Uh, sustainability to mining interests means of course, sustaining a certain rate or increase in the rate of extraction, whereas sustainability to environmentalists and public health advocates uh, means of course something uh, entirely different. And then of course, there's the question of sustainability on a national scale versus a global scale, right? So sustainability on a national scale, when it comes to critical materials, often means uh, something kind of synonymous with supply chain security, being able to sustain a steady flow of these elements that are needed for critical sectors, where sustainability on a global scale often brings in or immediately brings in questions of climate change and uh, transition to a post-carbon future, which of course um, we have a diminishing window uh, of time in order to take decisive action, which requires these elements. And so we have to be able to 
put all of these different sustainability concerns on the table to conceptualize them broadly and to integrate them in our policy. Our second major policy challenge, this is another question, are we capable of imagining China's role in the global rare earth economy as anything other than a threat or conspiracy against the West? Now, uh, one of the first things that I think we have to do, in, and this really um, is a call to people who are fluent in Mandarin uh, as well, uh, to bridge the yawning chasm between what is actually written in China's policy documents, what is documented in Chinese literature, and what is practiced in mining sites in China, and what is actually reported in the Anglophone press. Um, I'll share an anecdote here with you. Um, I was in a, I was having a discussion uh, with a, a former, I guess, uh, national security advisor uh, uh, in the U.S. Um, concerning a uh, draft of China's recent uh, rare earth law that uh, came out kind of, or was circulated for comment at the beginning of this year. And uh, we were talking about it in the context of, you know, having just been approached by journalists. And, I, and so I asked, oh, so, so you've read it, what do you think about it? And they said, oh, I never bother reading that stuff. I know it's all lies anyway. And so I was just kind of baffled. I thought, okay, like you, you've given public commentary on a thing that you haven't actually read. That actually explains a lot. And for us professors, you know, to speak without doing the reading is just, you know, scandalous indeed. Um, I think the other thing that we need to do is to build on and strengthen international cooperation in science and engineering research. One of the important and notable things is that uh, China's uh, rare earth research uh, uh, organizations have continued to host scientists from around the world even amidst uh, these ongoing sort of geopolitical flashpoints that have periodically flared over the past decade or so. And this is something that I think we need to strengthen because we all have a common interest in uh, making rare earth uh, mining and processing more environmentally and socially responsible and also securing a sustainable global supply. And along those lines, I think it's important to engage China's efforts in international standards development, uh, such as through the International Standards Organization, um, you know, in order to develop standards for these social, environmental, uh, occupational health and safety, and uh, standards for recycling as well. And um, so I think there's actually some real opportunities here, provided we are willing to let go of, you know, the, the influences of Hollywood movies and uh, certain video games and uh, the sort of narrative uh, pop culture talking points that uh, help us recast what China is doing in the rare, rare earth domain as some sort of neo-Cold War um, you know, rivalry, when in fact our, our inch, we have much more in common uh, than is typically appreciated. Um, the third major policy challenge, um, we'll ask this as well, are we capable of moving beyond antiquated notions of mining in order to support the construction of a circular economy as the new normal? So this requires that we look squarely at government subsidy practices that favor disposability, um, particularly around the exportation of e-waste or electronic waste. Uh, we should be focusing on re repatriating this. Um, and I am actually quite encouraged that there are initiatives underway in the UK to develop battery recycling capacity in particular. I think that's an excellent example. Um, and also we need to build the necessary social infrastructure in order to deploy proven recycling technologies at scale. So the thing with rare earth recycling or recycling of rare earth bearing components, it's not that we don't know how, it's not that we don't have um, the, the demonstrated technologies uh, to recycle different things. It's just that we don't have the necessary social infrastructure, right? How do we collect um, our rare earth bearing electronics and infrastructures and get them to a central location where they can actually be processed. Now, this to me is actually quite encouraging because the hard part we've already figured out, um, what remains then is sort of akin to, you know, how we eventually all had to figure out how to recycle our bottles and our newspapers. We can do this. So now let's talk about some possible pathways forward. What do we do to achieve critical mineral sustainability and security? I think um, if we take a um, dispassionate look at the status quo and look at what we're actually doing, our current approach is to dig a big hole somewhere new, 
uh, to source the rare earths, turn them into all sorts of different technological components, and then we build a trash mountain, but not in my backyard. This is where we are. The key point here is that rare earth elements are not destroyed in this process. Rare earths are not like fossil fuels in that they uh, are combusted and destroyed through use. Rather, knowing this and knowing uh, uh, how basic our status quo is, we can actually, we can reimagine our future in some interesting ways. And I think that actually begins by engaging with frontline communities to collaboratively collaboratively envision and design our pathway forward. And also, I mean, this is, you know, this is, um, if there are other folks from the US in the audience, they'll certainly sympathize with this. We have to dare to think beyond our election cycle while addressing the livelihood needs of the present. And also uh, to connect with established institutions um, at home and abroad, as well as community organizers in prospective mining, manufacturing and recycling sites. Um, because often the, the local issues with uh, heavy industry manufacturing or recycling siting in their area is not that the industry is there, it's that it is there in such a way that is generating active harm. And so uh, taking all of the lessons from critical development studies and development practice over the past several decades, we can apply them, I think, quite instructively to rare earths and start with a community engagement uh, from the get go. The second thing we can do is we can recycle. This is the low hanging fruit. Um, although, you know, the prospect of, of, of mining on the moon might be um, sexier and more exciting to some, we could actually just figure out how to recycle rather than digging up the moon or the Amazon or under the Greenland ice sheet, because currently less than 1% of all rare earths and less than 12% of all electronics period, um, those that are consumed are actually recycled. And so important achievements by EU, US and Japanese researchers have not been scaled up to unlock new and sustainable sources of rare earths and other critical materials that are accumulating around us in our waste. And so I think we also need to think about selectively and smartly repatriating um, production. So not just mining, but the uh, entire rare earth supply chain. And what this requires is that we rebuild industrial and research capacity on a regional scale. Um, it doesn't make sense for most or many countries to, to go it alone. So we need to collaborate with our neighbors and to uh, most importantly, to invest in the entire supply chain, not just the first stages in order to revive and stimulate innovative R&D. Uh, we can develop programs to pilot and deploy innovations at national and regional scales. And really importantly, we can stop exporting e-waste because this is treasure. Uh, that we are throwing away. And all of this requires, of course, that we legislate, right? So that we create a regulatory environment that rewards upstream firms for socially and environmentally responsible mining and processing. We provide things like tax incentives for downstream firms to purchase certified clean rare earth elements in order to create market certainty until we get to a place where we have a new bottom line where it's not the lowest cost, but it is the lowest social and environmentally uh, the lowest social and environmental cost. We also need to work at state, local, federal, and regional levels to create multiple clean, high-tech, and functionally renewable rare earth supply chains um, so that we don't recreate a monopoly somewhere else. And above all, I think that we should seize the low-hanging fruit. So here we have a pile of discarded cell phones. Uh, this is a photo from South Africa. Um, you know, there are abundant resources around us, rare earths and otherwise, uh, that we can access without digging new holes in the ground uh, while also reducing our overall global waste footprint. So I'll end there. I'm happy to take your questions. My contact info is here. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to get in touch or to join the discussions that unfold on Twitter. All right, so thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions and the discussion. Thank you.